Imagine a world where every instinctual need is commodified. You're free to fulfill any simple or complex desire. Sympathy, control, accomplishments, they are all there. Just reach out and take it. This is an abstraction of the modern digital world. New websites and software succeed by exploiting human propensities the best. Our natural programming has plenty of weaknesses to exploit. In this presentation, I will explore the consequences of attempting to fulfill our natural desires by using digital surrogates. In Fred Wilcox's The Forbidden Planet from 1956, we are met with a father living alone with his daughter, who has never met another man. They are interrupted by three astronauts, and soon after an invisible monster starts terrorizing them all. At the end of the movie, we are shown that the monster is the materialization of the father's destructive instincts against the intruders who disturbed the incestuous order with his daughter. Amaranth is a digital monster of a similar origin. She has been manifested from the aggregate subconscious of tens of thousands of young lonely men acting as a digital surrogate of their instinctual desire to support a woman. But, as with most digital surrogates, they are a misdirection. A surrogate from the digital world attempting to fulfill an instinct from reality. The price they pay with their donations is beyond any monetary value. Sacrificing resources on attempting to fulfill an instinctual desire, yet never having it fulfilled breeds bitterness and depression like nothing else. YouTubers in general all share this type of manifested personalities, shaped in an evolutionary way through trial and error, in order to be the most appealing to their audience. The YouTuber is giving up an important part of their humanity, the true personality of their being. They replace it with this ridiculously fake and over-the-top enthusiasm that's nothing like an authentic personality, a mass-produced formulaic persona that has to constantly appeal to the lowest common denominator, while being void of any contrarian opinion that the algorithm might punish them for. They are terrified to upset their audience, as it might cause a dent in their ad revenue. In most cases, the YouTuber is charismatic and attractive. They are commodifying their sociable personality for countless unsociable parasites. The parasitic viewer contributes nothing meaningful in this relationship. They are semi-passive observers unable to experience what the host is experiencing, but escapes into the fantasy that they one day will become the host. The viewers are the parasites feasting on the extroverted energy of the host, and if you were to insult the symbiosis, you are directly interfering with the fantasy of them one day becoming the host themselves. This is the principle of parasocial relationships at its most refined. The gondola meme is the embodiment of these concepts. Gondola gets to observe every fantasy space, but he has no arms and is destined to observe, never to interact. His fate is to sit still and become conflicted with the desire of wanting to experience, but will never have the ability to do so. A good metaphor for our new isolated online generation, observing every desire and fantasy possible through a screen that will never be fulfilled. We are able to see something similar to this concept in Blade Runner. At first glance, a street filled with life. Yet most humans have left for off-world colonies and the streets are filled with surrogate humans, replicants. Only a few actual humans walk the street. It's a very lonely place. This is a clear parallel to many parasocial events online, such as Twitch streams. It appears as socialization is happening, yet no meaningful relationships are formed. And that is the very nature of digital surrogates. They become popular by mimicking instinctual desires, but do not provide any useful output. The gaming and gambling sectors have merged, using one another's sophisticated strategies to attract and profit from players. As a result, games are becoming more and more commercialized, while gambling is becoming more like a game. In 93% of games deemed appropriate for 12-year-old players, pay-to-win loot boxes are present. The purpose of loot boxes is to sustain us via repeated cycles of anticipation, uncertainty, and feedback. Some loot boxes contain deceptive elements designed specifically to take advantage of players' psychological weaknesses and boost their desire to spend money. In these techniques, highly active players are found by examining the company's player database. And after that, paid in-game material is created that is specially catered to their individual interests. 
such as game products that are the same color as their favorite sports team. Loot boxes and other RNG-based mechanics in video games are surrogates for our innate motivation to continue hunting, fishing, and foraging. This is an exploitation of the object cause of desire. This is a term in psychoanalytic theory, meaning the unattainable property of a desire. For example, when you wish to purchase a new product, you desire the new object. But once it arrives, it quickly becomes just another object. The desire exists only by it being unobtainable. My next video will dive deep into the grotesque future of video games, so subscribe for that. In the Twilight Zone episode, A Nice Place to Visit, the main character, Rocky, is a small-time crook who is killed during a robbery attempt. He then finds himself in a strange afterlife, where he is granted every wish he desires, from beautiful women to unlimited money. However, as the episode progresses, Rocky becomes increasingly bored and dissatisfied with his seemingly perfect existence, eventually understanding that he is actually in hell. Rocky realized this as the desires were instantly obtainable. Digital surrogates, on the other hand, is an even worse hell, as they evolve to disguise even the struggle and journey of acquiring the desire. Only for you to realize you've wasted decades of your life on pointless achievements for the sake of the achievement itself. Recently, I've been looking at old video game levels I played as a teenager, except I've been doing so from game-breaking perspectives. No clipping through the walls and exploring how everything was set up. These experiments completely shatter my nostalgia. I get a dissociative view of this fantasy as if I'm observing it for the first time and I get to see it for what it really is. A toneless combination of programming and polygons. The game is revealing to me the horror which always existed behind the pixel skin. It's all lifeless data, and anything that was fascinating in the game was surrogates stimulating my biological imperatives. Most video game achievements have negligible real-world applications. They're artificial challenges with artificial fulfillment. Yet we pursue these objectives with the same vigor and passion we would have normally used to fulfill physiological needs. For hundreds of thousands of years, human beings have resided in tribes of about 30 to 70 people. And they saw maybe 20 young females in total during their entire lives. Our minds are absolutely not updated to being bombarded with this overstimuli. Our brains are wired to operate within the social context of a small community. The programming was crucial for ancient human survival. However, the tribal context of life was subverted during the Industrial Revolution when the extended family was torn apart in order to move laborers into the cities. But a deep evolutionary need for communities continues to express itself. This is why people are so compelled to use digital surrogates in order to tweet, super chat, or check the news incessantly. We are wired to crave connection, yet the pseudonymity and detachment of online platforms trigger emotional reactions and amplify negative behaviors, resulting in an ever more polarized society. This is the exact opposite of the original function of the instinct. While online discourse can be useful for staying informed and connecting with others, it is not a good substitute for real communities, as they provide a sense of belonging, shared values, and face-to-face -face interactions, while online platforms offer shallow and faceless connections. I don't think there is any meaning inside these boxes containing digital surrogates. They are mostly dopamine hits with diminishing returns, which are fleeting and do not provide any long-lasting purpose. In most cases, people who are deeply involved in digital surrogates are never satisfied. The influencer is constantly seeking to increase their number of followers while their audience quickly moves on from one video to the next. Similarly, the speedrunner is motivated to achieve ever more challenging feats. Our instincts are not updated to fit the ever-increasing amounts of biological exploits that will become more complex as technology progresses, especially artificial intelligence. Attempting to fulfill instinctual desires from digital surrogates lead to toneless explorations of sensual enjoyments. Abusing our biological imperatives, which are indifferent to our long-term well-being or civilization as a whole, the digital and the analog world are distinctly separate and should be treated as such.